Hey everyone, in this session I'm going to talk to you guys about hemolytic anemia. So I'm going to first talk to you guys about what the definition of hemolytic anemia is and I'm also going to tell you guys some diagnostic markers that you can um, use to actually discern whether someone is um, experiencing hemolytic anemia and then I'm also going to tell you guys about some of the symptoms of hemolytic anemia and um, some of the different types of hemolytic anemia. So to begin, um, what is hemolytic anemia? Well, when we look at the word hemolytic anemia, uh, we know anemia. Many of us know anemia. So that's the first word I'm going to actually focus on right now. So all we have to do is just break it apart. Um, we, in a normal um, reference range for hemoglobin levels within the blood, it's about 115 to 165 grams per liter. Now, this is just a sample reference range, and there are um, different reference ranges um, depending on the, the country you live in, which hospital you work at, etc. But um, this is the reference range I'm going to use um, for hemoglobin levels today. Now, there's also a reference range for the amount of erythrocytes per liter of blood as well, which is uh, typically 5.5 to 8.5 uh, times 10 to the 9th per liter. Now, again, this is just a sample reference range. The reference range does change depending on your location. Now, anemia anemia is really either low erythrocyte levels and or low hemoglobin levels. So um, according to my reference ranges I used, uh, anemia can be due to uh, low erythrocyte levels, so less than the reference range, or it can be low hemoglobin levels, which is again less than the reference range that I supplied here. So it could be less than 115 grams per liter. So Anemia is just pretty much this. What this is, it's either low erythrocyte levels or low hemoglobin levels. Now, what is hemolytic? So, hemolytic, um, when we look at hemolysis, hemo um, means blood, lysis is destruction, so blood destruction or degradation. So, hemolysis really just means degradation of blood. So, when we look at the average lifespan of a red blood cell, the average lifespan of a red blood cell is actually 120 days. So hemolysis is typically considered when we see that red blood cells are not able to actually make it to 120 days uh, of age. Um, so for some reason or another, red blood cells are being destroyed before they can make it to 120 days. So when you look at the whole population of red blood cells, you can see that the average lifespan of that population of red blood cells is less than 120 days. Um, and when that is the case, we consider this hemolysis. Something is causing their degradation. And, um, and because there's um, an increase in degradation, they're, they're not living as long as they should be, we're going to have some adverse effects. We're going to have um, the recycling process taking a bit too long or being a little overtaxed. Um, which means that you're going to have some of the symptoms I'll show you here in a bit. So when we look at the erythrocyte, it's um, again, it's that concave disc-shaped um, uh, cell. It has no nucleus and it has no mitochondria. Now, erythrocytes are actually um, produced or a more mature form of something what we call a reticulocyte. Now, reticulocytes are more spheroidal in shape. They have remnants of their nucleus. Um, so they're a, an immature um, version of an erythrocyte. Now, when an erythrocyte is broken down or destroyed, we um, see there's a large release of hemoglobin. Again, erythrocytes are pretty much just bags of hemoglobin. There are millions of hemoglobin molecules within an erythrocyte. Now, if you've seen my video before about um, heme catabolism, we know that hemoglobin is made up of heme group as well as a globin protein. Now the globin protein portion of the hemoglobin is actually broken down into its um, respective amino acids and can be used and recycled for other processes. But the heme is a little more tricky. It has to be recycled in, a, in a, an appropriate manner. And how it is done is it's actually um, eventually broken down into or processed into bilirubin. 
Now, um, for more information, check out my heme catabolism video. Now, um, the iron of heme is actually uh, released from heme and can actually be stored as um, hemosiderin. Now, um, if there are any extra hemoglobin um, left that perhaps these degradation processes cannot keep up with, hemoglobin will actually be bound by something known as haptoglobin. So haptoglobin is a protein that will actually bind to free hemoglobin. Once the haptoglobin binds to the hemoglobin, the haptoglobin will actually be processed and degraded by macrophages. Now, one other thing that we don't normally talk about when an erythrocyte is destroyed is the fact that it, uh, the erythrocyte actually contains a lot of lactate dehydrogenase enzyme, and that is actually also released as well when uh, erythrocytes are actually um, destroyed. So having looked at the schematic of how um, and what is um, processed and released from a destroyed erythrocyte, we can begin to understand the diagnostic criteria or the markers we can use to look at um, the diag or look for in the diagnosis of hemolytic anemia. So the first one is in fact bilirubin. So we know that if there's a lot of erythrocytes being destroyed, we're going to have an increase in the level of bilirubin because bilirubin is a heme degradation product. The second um, thing that we've seen that is released from erythrocytes is in fact lactate dehydrogenase. And because um, it's because actually erythrocytes have a large amount of lactate dehydrogenase. They actually don't have mitochondria and rely on anaerobic metabolism. And the byproduct of anaerobic metabolism is lactate. So they use um, a large amount of lactate dehydrogenase. So you'll see an increase in lactate dehydrogenase in the blood as well. The third thing is there's actually a decrease in free haptoglobin. As I mentioned before, haptoglobin will actually irreversibly bind to hemoglobin and then once it's bound to hemoglobin macrophages will sweep in and destroy the haptoglobin so you'll actually see a decrease in haptoglobin levels. The fourth thing that we can see is that there's an increase in reticulocyte count. Now I didn't mention this before but this is actually a normal process. If we're seeing a decrease in erythrocyte count your bone marrow will actually compensate and will actually increase the production of reticulocytes um, to compensate for the decrease in erythrocytes. And it, we call this left shifting. There's a shift in the population of red blood cells and we'll see more reticulocytes being released from the bone marrow into circulation to compensate for the decrease in erythrocytes. And the last thing that we can look at that is not typically um, measured is actually urine hemosiderin. As I mentioned before, hemosiderin is just the storage form of iron which is released from the heme moiety. Now um, again uh, this one this um, marker is not typically looked at we can usually figure it out from the other four markers but this is another one just in case there is some issue um, in other markers you can look at the um, urinary output of hemosiderin. So now that we know some of the markers we can look at um, to determine if a patient is undergoing hemolytic anemia. What are some of the clinical findings? What are some of the symptoms um, that a patient experiences when they are undergoing hemolytic anemia? Well, one of them is something known as hemoglobinuria, which is just dark urine. And that's because there is an increased hemoglobin excretion in the urine. Another one is splenomegaly. So this is because the spleen enlarges um, due to increased RBC filtration. So uh, splenomegaly may actually be the cause of um, in, uh, hemolytic anemia. There might be an increased destruction of red blood cells due to an increased spleen. So another clinical finding we can look at is actually jaundice. And now this is because of the increased levels of bilirubin in the, um, the patient. Now, um, one indication of jaundice is scleral icterus, um, which is yellowing of the whites of the eyes. Another um, clinical finding could be uh, gallstones. Now, this is because of the increased bilirubin again, and it's because bilirubin is actually incorporated into bile. There might be um, an increase in bile formation and resulting in an increase in gallstones. 
Another um, indication of hemolytic anemia can be pulmonary hypertension, and that's because of increased hemoglobin. And another one is thrombosis, which is due to um, a multitude of factors. So what are some of the types and some of the causes of hemolytic anemia? Well, an easy way to look at hemolytic anemia um, is, is hemolytic, uh, is, is hemolytic anemia due to immune causes or non-immune causes? If you look at immune causes, you have to think of autoimmune or self-immune or immunity to self, or you have to look at alloimmune or immunity to others or other human beings. Now, alloimmune is really easy to think of because you can think of transfusion reactions. If you give um, a blood type, uh, a unit of blood with a different blood type than the patient's blood type, you'll, you'll have a hemolytic anemia. And that is a, a form of um, alloimmune he hemolytic anemia. Now with autoimmune hemolytic anemia, there's a few different, um, a few different types. Uh, one is known as warm, one is known as cold, and another one is known as proxismal cold hemoglobinuria. And I'll get into these types of hemolytic anemia in another lesson. So in the case of non-immune hemolytic anemia, we have to actually look at the structure and the components of the red blood cell itself. So we start by looking at the membrane, the hemoglobin inside of the red blood cell, and then we go down as far as the enzymes that are used within the red blood cell. So in the case of membrane-associated um, problems causing non-immune hemolytic anemia, uh, there are a couple. There's um, a, a genetic condition known as hereditary elliptocytosis and another called hereditary spherocytosis. Now, if we look at problems in hemoglobin that can cause non-immune hemolytic anemia, we think of thalassemia, and we can also think of sickle cell anemia, which cause problems in the structure of hemoglobin, which renders the uh, red blood cell um, misshapen or misformed and can actually lead to a degradation of the, the red blood cell. And finally, when we look at enzymes within the red blood cell, we can see that um, because red blood cells are critically, um, critically involved in anaerobic metabolism, they use a lot of glycolysis because they have no mitochondria, they require high levels of some enzymes, and some of them are glucose 6-phosphatidehydrogenase, which is needed for the pentose phosphate shunt, and um, another enzyme known as pyruvate kinase for, again, glycolysis. Now, if these either of these enzymes are deficient in any way, we can see that uh, red blood cells will be in a poor health and they can actually um, die and become hemolytic. They'll, they'll actually die before their um, an average lifespan of 120 days. So they'll, they'll have a, a smaller lifespan because of any deficiency in any of these enzymes. Anyways, guys, that was uh, hemolytic anemia lesson one. In the next lesson, I'm going to talk to you guys about how um, we differentiate between immune and non-immune by laboratory test. And I'll also get into more specific details about um, each of these subtypes of immune and non-immune hemolytic anemia. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more videos like this one. And as always, thank you so much for watching and have a great day.